video, we will be looking at the field of compressible flows and compressible fluid mechanics. So if you're a student in mechanical or aerospace engineering, or if you're just someone who is interested in rocket propulsion, this video will be very interesting. We will be solving four different examples in typical compressible flow problems. For example, sonic booms, shock waves, rocket propulsion, and hypersonic flight. Let's get started. A jet passes you at a speed of 350 knots, a thousand feet above. The temperature on the heads-up display reached 10 degrees Celsius. After how long do you hear the sound of the engine? So for this question, we have a jet passing beyond you and you want to find the distance and the time it takes. So the first thing is always make a diagram as you all know in your calculus class. You know, so first we have the plane there. We have a thousand feet, we have the airspeed and the temperature. The first thing you can do is use the formula for the speed of sound, which is square root of gamma RT, where gamma equals 1.4 for air, and R is the ideal gas constant of 287 joules per kilogram times Kelvin. And when you plug in the values, you get the, the number as shown. Next, you can also convert the airspeed to kilometers per hour because we have knots here. Then we can convert that to meters per second, and we can then find the Mach number. So once we have the Mach number, we can find alpha equals inverse sine of 1 over m, and which is the value shown. Now alpha is the Mach angle. Every Mach number will have an angle at some point, and then it will produce a sonic boom at that angle. Next you have the angle and you have the height of a thousand feet, which we can convert to meters. So then we can use tan of alpha equals that value over x, where x is the distance, and then you can solve for that. When you have the distance, you have the time. Air at Mach 5.25 and a pressure of 35 kilopascals and temperature of negative 45 Celsius flows over the inlet ramp of a hypersonic aircraft. The ramp angle is 20 degrees from the horizontal. Calculate pressure, temperature, and velocity of the air beyond the inlet. For question two, we have an oblique shock coming in. We have a Mach number of 5.25, we have pressure of 35 kilopascals, and temperature, when we convert that to Kelvin, we get 228K. We have beta equals the angle which we need to find of the shock, because when we draw a diagram, the first thing we can do is find the normal component of that incoming flow, which equals M1 sine beta, but we don't know what beta is, right? Beta is simply the angle of the oblique shock, and what you do is, you simply go in the oblique shock charts and you look at where Mach number equals 5.25 and you have an angle of 20 degrees. Based on that, you can get the angle of about 29.4. When you have that, you also have gamma for air. So MN1 equals M1 sine beta of 2.572 and then we can find the shock component of M2. So M2 occurs beyond the oblique shock and since it's a shock wave, Mach number will slow down and pressure and temperature will go up. MN2 squared equals 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 multiplied by MN1 squared divided by gamma times MN1 squared minus gamma minus 1 over 2. Gamma we know and MN1 we know, so you simply plug in and solve for MN2. So now you have beta, you have the angle and you also have MN2. So from this you can use the formula to find Mach 2 which is the Mach number beyond the shock, which is MN2 over sine beta minus the angle. Now we have the Mach number, so we can actually solve for some more stuff. You can do P2 over P1 to find pressure equals 2 gamma MN1 square minus gamma plus 1 over gamma plus 1. You simply plug in MN1 and you can solve for P2 over P1, which is the ratio of pressure, of static pressure, which is 7.551. Next you can if you know P1, you times that by 7 and you get P2. For T2 over T1, it is quite a long formula, but it is simply a function of gamma and MN1, for which the values you both know. So you simply plug in everything and you get 2.21. So the temperature 2 will also be higher because we have a shock wave, and that's what shock waves do. They raise the pressure and temperature while simultaneously decreasing the speed. Also, you can find this fluid velocity because that's what the question asked you. You do A2 equals square root of gamma RT2 because now you have the temperature beyond the shock so you simply plug that in and you get V2 as the value shown. Air at Mach of 2.1 and 600 kilopascals pressure 
flows in a duct which is 0.5 meters in diameter and 2 meters long. The friction in the duct has a factor of 0.025. Find the Mach number and pressure at the exit of the duct. So for the next question we have flow with friction and this question is very interesting because let's say you design an aircraft right and you have a cabin of an aircraft of a hypersonic aircraft or even a, a normal aircraft. You guys need to know that pipes and any metal ducts they have a friction factor which means that when fluid flows in a pipe it loses some momentum because the pipe slows it down. Think about the time when you walk outside in the ice it's very slippery right because the friction is very low and you can slip and you can fall. And if you walk on sand, you, you notice that you run a lot slower because sand has a lot of friction. Similarly, fluids also experience friction because in fluid mechanics, the, the bottommost point of the fluid is actually zero velocity because that's the boundary layer. So in this case, you have pipe of a friction factor of 0 0.025 and engineers normally find this friction factor from experiments and conducting a lot of tests and it's an empirical value. So it's not 100% accurate. You have diameter of 0.5 meters and you have length of 2 meters and you have an incoming Mach of 2.1 and you have a pressure of 600 kilopascals. So with that incoming Mach of 2.1, we can sub into the final flow formula which is F times L1 star over D and that's a function of Mach and gamma. Gamma obviously is 1.4 for air and when you plug in that, you get that value. So L1 star is the distance for how long it will take the flow to choke. When you have supersonic flow entering a pipe with full friction, it'll slow down until it chokes. And beyond that, you will have a shock because it cannot choke anymore. So we find L1 star to be 6.667 meters because let's say that you have a pipe which is 6.67 meters long. It'll have to travel that much at that entrance Mach number to choke. So next we can use the Fafano relation, which is F times L1 star over D minus L2 star over D equals FL over D. So L is the length we have of the pipe and we need to solve for L2 star because we need to find the Mach number downstream. It's basically solving it backwards. So solve for that F L2 star over D and you get the value as shown. And from that you can solve the Mach number. Now in this case you may, you may have to use the Fano tables. Now these tables can be found anywhere online or you can just use a numerical solver and get it. So when we have that, we can now find pressures, the critical pressure at both points. So you find P over P star at M1 and P2 over P star at M2. Since you have M1 and M2, we can find the ratio of pressure and the critical pressure is the uniform point where Mach number equals one. When you have P over P star at Mach one and P2 over P star at Mach two, you simply solve for P2 by taking a ratio and you will notice that it is a value higher than the incoming pressure. So that's your M2 and P2 there. A rocket engine stores fuel at 2500 Kelvin and 304 kilopascals. The nozzle throat and the exit areas equal 0.1 and 1.2 square meters respectively. The fuel constants are gamma equals 1.3 and R equals 475 joules per kilogram Kelvin. The engine is fired on a test stand where the outside pressure reads 95 kilopascals. Find the thrust that the engine generates. So for this question, we have a rocket nozzle. Let's make a diagram and put all the constants in there. We have chamber pressure, temperature, the areas, gamma, and we have R. So initially, to make the problem easier, we can assume isentropic flow everywhere. That means the stagnation pressure everywhere in the nozzle is constant. So let's begin first with the expansion ratio. It's just the ratio of the areas. So it'll be 1.2 meters square or 0.1 meters square, which is 12. And by using this number 12, we can then find the Mach number at the exit in the case of isentropic flow. So it's just the area Mach relation. You can either use this equation or use a graph and then find the Mach number. So it gets about 3.744 at this area ratio. Then we can find density since air is an ideal gas, P equals rho RT as you all know. So density equals P over RT, which is about 0.256 kilogram per meter cube. So now let's look at the nozzle performance, right? Obviously rocket nozzles don't always operate at the condition explained in the previous slide. That Mach number was for optimum expansion, but obviously you, know, you may have differences, but so we need to look at the cases of over expansion and under expansion. So let's look at shock waves in, inside the nozzle. Do they occur or do they not? The way you check for shock waves is that you first consider optimum expansion 
and then you consider a normal shock wave at the tip of the nozzle because after that you will have oblique shocks outside and then the nozzle will be under expanded. So let's first do optimum expansion case which is before. So P0 over PE equals all that and then we can get the PE at 2.2476 kilopascals. Just use the formula for isentropic flow and plug in mark at, at the exit of ME. So when you get all that, the exit pressure to create an optimum flow condition is 2.247 kilopascals, okay? So that's what you need for best expansion. But we have the problem here that the ambient pressure is 95 kilopascals. It's more than the exit pressure. So now what? So obviously this means that the flow is not under expanded. We have 95 kilopascals exceeds the outside pressure for optimum expansion. So the flow is over expanded, okay? So now let's look at the pressure required outside to create a normal shock at, at the exit. We have Mach number at the exit is that and the pressure ratio as well. So we can use that to find the normal shock relation Px over P1 where Px is the ambient pressure. We plug in that same exact Mach number and we get about 15. So then we can find Px over P0 by taking a ratio, so that's Px over Pe multiplied by Pe over P0, right? Pe over P0, we know before, we just did that, and we get about 0.116. So Px is about 35 kilopascals. But now this means that we need about 35 kilopascals outside to obtain a normal shock at the exit, but 95 kilopascals is still more than that. That means we obviously have normal shocks on the inside. If you're confused by this, I do recommend you watch my two clips on how rocket engines work in where I explain this in more detail. So let's do a recap of what we have so far. 95 kilopascals is what we are looking for, okay? So let's first go all the way to the right. 2.2476 kilopascals gives you optimum expansion. As we raise the back pressure, we get oblique shocks inside. As we raise it even more to 35 kilopascals, we get normal shocks at the tip. And then we have normal shocks inside. So the nozzle is operating in the over-expanded case. To find the normal shock solution, I do recommend you do this yourself. I did write a MATLAB code to achieve this, but for you guys, I do, you know, just do it by yourself. It's not that difficult. You just simply use your, make a diagram like shown here, and then you consider a normal shock at a location, and then the flow chart which I used, and then you can use that to make your own code and do it. It's definitely a numerical method. We can also find the mass flow rate. So P0 over P equals 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times gamma over gamma minus 1. This is where Mach equals 1, so I just cancel out the Mach number. Do the same for T0 over T, and you get about 1.5928. The density at the throat of the nozzle, we can use P0 over P equals pressure naught over P times T over T naught, which we just solved for right now. And then you multiply those two and you get about 1.5928. We did calculate the stagnation density before at 0.256, so we just divide that by this value and you get about 0.1607. So the density goes drops because obviously it's a compressible flow problem, so the density will change. Then we have the, the temperature which we can also find. So it's about 0 0.87 times 2,500. And then you can finally use the speed of sound formula, A equals gamma RT, and get about 1160 meters per second. Then the mass flow rate formula is very easy. It's a density times velocity times area. So we just found the density and the velocity before and the area we know as 0.1 meters squared. So you multiply them all and you get about 18.621 kgs per second. This is the mass flow rate and no matter what, it does stay constant everywhere because obviously it's the same nozzle, right? So it's not gonna change. Okay, so in my MATLAB algorithm, I plugged in guess values for normal shock area Obviously it has to be between 0.1 and 1.2 meters because square meters because we're in the middle of the nozzle. So you get area shock as about 0.445 square meters. Mach 2 equals 0 0.44602, Mach 1 equals 0 0.2.87 before the normal shock. So the ex exit Mach will now be lower than Mach 2 because the flow becomes subsonic. So incompressible flows, subsonic flows, you know, they will slow down. So you get about 0.2 and you also get temperatures in the algorithm. So we can use some stuff, right? We can use the M2, M exit, and T2 to get the parameters at the exit. That's all we need, actually. So we have M2 
after the normal shock is 0.4602, the Mach number at the nozzle exit is about 0.2, and temperature 2 is about 2000 Kelvin. So find T2 over T0 first by plugging in the Mach number at M2, and then also TE over T0 by using M exit. Just use the T over T0 formula for isentropic flow conditions. Then we can use all that, and we can also get T2 over T0 multiplied by T0 over TE. Because since we're trying to find the temperature at the exit, we always need to relate that back to the temperature initially. So we can take some multiplications and find it. So you get the exit temperature as about 2097 Kelvin. Then we can find the exit sound speed as gamma RTE, which is 1137 meters per second. And then we can get the exit velocity at about 227 meters per second. Because we have the Mach number at 0.2, and you just multiply that by the sound speed. So the formula for the force equals m dot times ue plus pe minus p naught times ae. In my MATLAB algorithm, I assume that the normal shock tries to maintain pressure equilibrium, which means that the exit pressure and the ambient pressure can be assumed the same. In, in, actuality, in actuality, this may not be always true. You have to perform a sort of experiment to do it, but this is a quite a good conservative assumption. So that term will cancel out, and you have the force equals m dot times ue very simply which is 18.621 times 227.58, which, which gives you that value. So that's it for the answer. My name is Vinayak and I would like to welcome you to my channel, VD Engineering. I am currently an aerospace engineer working in the industry and the goal of this channel is to just grow and pursue students to be more passionate about the aerospace and aviation field. My channel covers videos on flight simulation, fluid mechanics, computational fluid dynamics, rocket propulsion, and more topics. The goal of this channel is to just spread around the world because aerospace is a very growing field and there are a lot of jobs that need to be filled, especially very specialized roles. And my goal is to just spread knowledge and to you know grow as a community on YouTube because there, there are not that many channels which are covering my content. And with that being said, if you're new here, I do recommend you subscribe if you want more videos like this on aerospace engineering. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.